for all of you. It's exciting to be here. We've, we've really enjoyed our time here in Las Vegas. Um, we've enjoyed our time getting to know the church and getting to know all of you. And as Pastor Barry said, uh, I am the director of the Calvary Training Center uh, in La Gloria. Uh, we have four ministries. We have Church Planet International, which you all, I think, know about. It's the idea that we're raising up nationals who go out and plant churches all throughout Latin America. Um, we have a kids program called Kids of the King, where kids come up the hill we minister to them three days a week. We minister the word and food and help with homework and, and practical uh, love in their lives. We have an internship program. Uh, we have four interns right now, people who come for longer terms, and they will stay and live there and uh, learn what it is to serve cross-culturally. And then <clears throat> finally, we have teams. We have groups of people who come down for short spurts. We have a team coming this week, Rowdy Bunch from Las Vegas. So you can, you can pray for us, those... Women are coming down to bless and minister, and, and we're so excited to have them. You know, this week is my, uh, my family's 15-year anniversary in Mexico. 15 years. It's hard for me to believe. Packed up our 1997 Pathfinder with a whole bunch of stuff. My poor son was crammed in the back seat. We made our way to Sonora 15 years ago. I told my wife it's our quinceanera. Tried to talk her into the big pink dress and the cake, but she wasn't going for it. But you know, from the moment we arrived in Mexico, we felt welcome. We felt this tremendous welcome from the culture, from the people who were ministering with us and to us. And, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit tonight is that sense of welcome. The way that, how, how we know that we're welcome. Think about it. From the moment you walked in here tonight, how many times did you hear that word welcome? How many times did you see it on the screen? Did someone shake your hand? Did they make you feel welcome? And I think that's so important within the body of Christ because the reality is without that sense of welcome, we're not going to appreciate how much God wants us to be here. And, and so tonight I want to uh, look a little bit about that concept. You know, the word means the desired guest, someone who you want to be there. You know those desired guests, those people you want in your home? You know those undesired guests, those people you're ready to, to see go? Well, well, in this case, we want to look at the idea of what, what it is that makes us feel welcome to worship. So if you don't have a Bible tonight, please raise your hand. Um, the ushers are going to come forward and provide one for you. We're going to look at a very short psalm. It's just five verses. <clears throat> We're going to look at what it means to be welcomed into the presence of God to worship what it means to come into his presence and understand what it is that he wants to do in our lives. See, there's a reality as we come into worship, and we have to define that first. Worship really is getting close to God in a way that makes us recognize his greatness and his goodness. Worship is recognizing God in all of his infinite glory. See, we can come into any place, but if we don't come in with that sense of awe and wonder, then we'll never fully appreciate what it is that we're doing. And there's a reality tonight, as we get close to his greatness and his glory, we might feel unworthy. We might feel like, you know what, I got no business being here. As, as much as we can feel welcome in the home of someone, there's also the possibility that we could walk into a place like this and say, I'm unworthy. I don't feel welcome. But I want you to see something tonight as we work through this psalm. There's a truth here, and that is as we recognize that greatness of God, it's going to transform us. It's going to change us and make us more like him. So why don't we pray, and then let's read the whole psalm, and then let's work through it and ask us, how does God welcome us to worship? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have this opportunity again to be here. We've worshipped you, but Lord, now we want to worship you in a different way, by looking at your word and seeing how you reveal yourself to us. Would you tonight speak to us? Would you reveal more of yourself to us? And would you make us leave here um, changed, that we would see you in such a way that we would be transformed by your glory? Lord, use your word tonight. Use your spirit. Pour it out. Make us like you, we pray. And we ask all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 15 says, uh, Psalm 15, a psalm of David. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle and who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness 
and he who speaks truth in his heart, who, he who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money as usury, at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Psalm 15 was, they called it an entrance rite. It was something that was basically read before you would go into a place of worship. And see, David was a man of worship. He was very acquainted with it. He would sing in the hills as he cared for, for sheep. It was part of his life. And yet here's something unique where David says, but Lord, what about when we go to that special place? What about those times when we're going into your presence? How is that different? And see, David is meditating on this, and he's basically asking, who's worthy? Who can do this, really? See, I can worship on the hill while I'm caring for sheep, but what about those times when I'm going into that holy place, and I know that your presence is there? What access does man have with the creator of the universe? Who are we to approach him and say, I want to be in your presence? And so as we look at verse 1, we see that David asks a question, and he bases it on this place. He says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Now, that word abide is not a long-term word. It's who may come into your presence temporarily. Who can come in and visit, basically? And he asks, who can do that? And remember, the tabernacle was that place where uh, God had chosen to move about for a period of time with the, the Israelites, right? Where his presence said, I'm marking a place to go. Now, I want you to follow me. And ultimately, it ended in this place that's called Mount Moriah, what David calls the Holy Hill. And see, David is saying, I know you're calling us into your presence. I know you're asking us to be there. But David understands you're going to both reveal who I am and you're going to transform me in the process. See, Mount Moriah was a very special place. That was a place, remember, where Abraham was going to offer Isaac. And at the last minute, God said, no, no, no. I understand that your heart is toward me. Don't do it. It was also a place, if you look in 2 Samuel, where God put David to the test. There's a story at the end of the book of 2 Samuel where David, get, uh, David gets all puffed up and proud, and he, he begins to count. He does a census. He says, let me just see how many people are in my army. Right? And it's all about him, all about his numbers. And so God brings this plague upon the nation, and then at some point he stops it. He says, enough. I'm not going to carry this out. God in his mercy doesn't execute the judgment that he could. And so this very place, this, this place where the uh, tabernacle ends up, David approaches the owner, and the owner says, take it, you know, set up a monument here. And David says, no, 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 I will pay for this place. How can I take something for free that costs so much of God? And it's that place, remember, David pays for, and he buys, and he establishes the permanent resting place for the tabernacle. See, the tabernacle, this place always represents a place where death is stopped and life begins. And isn't that a great picture of worship? Worship is that place where the death of this world stops and life, true life, knowledge of God begins. And so David is saying, Lord, who can approach this place? Again, it was costly. It was significant. And obviously it points us to that holy hill where Jesus would offer his life. It reminds us of that place where God himself would give himself in payment for our sin. It's a place where death is stopped. See, worship is always going to bring us into that place of life. And sometimes I think that can be startling. It can reveal us. And it can say, look, I know who I am. I know what I'm about. And I know that I do not belong here. I love that as you read through the life of David, he was so concerned about this place. In 2 Samuel 7, David at some point in his life said, you know, Lord, I'm sitting here in this beautiful palace, and you're over there in a tent. Let me build you a place. Let me make you a vacation home, God. I, I got this, right? I can do this. And it's so fascinating because the Lord comes to him and he reveals a word and he says, are you going to build a house for me? Have I ever dwelt in a place built by human hands? God basically challenges David and says, you know what? I, I don't need a home. 
I'm eternal, I'm infinite, I'm beyond all this place. I cannot be contained. And yet then he turns around and he makes a promise to David and he says, but I will build a family for you and I will build a home for you and it will be forever. I will build an eternal reign and one of your sons, your son, will sit on that throne. And again, he's talking about Jesus. See, God keeps bringing him back to the eternal. As we approach this place of worship, we're going to be moved to what's eternal. And that's exactly what God was doing with David. He was saying, look, don't worry about that, David, and yet maintain that sense of wonder. Maintain that sense of honor that I'm allowed to come into his presence. And so the question is this, how do we maintain that sense of wonder as we come into God's presence? We know as believers we can worship anywhere, right? You can worship in the car, you can worship at your, work, your place of work, at home, you can worship anywhere, but there's something unique when God brings us together and says, my presence is in this place, So let's look through the rest of the psalm. Let's look at some of the areas that David wanted us, as God invites us in, to examine our lives and ask ourselves, is this my standard for worship? Let's look at verse 2. David begins with this, he who walks uprightly and who works righteousness. Now remember, David was writing from an Old Testament perspective. He didn't know the finished work of Christ, but he always understood that it was about a transformed life that it wasn't just about rituals. In Psalm 51, David would write, you didn't require a sacrifice or I would have brought it or burn offerings. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. David knew that from the get-go, God was looking at things like our walk, our righteousness, our desire to be near him and like him. And see, I I believe that our worship will always reveal and refine character. It will always do those things. It will begin working on the inner person. As we stood here, as we sang those things about God, what did it do in your heart? Did it challenge you to say, I want to be like that? I want to be like Jesus? David begins with our inner man, and he calls us to examine who we really are. And you know what? This is the only place that we can do that and feel security that there's not condemnation. As we allow him to examine our inner man, that integrity, we know that he's there saying, and I want to build you up in this. I want to help you walk through this. When he talks about integrity, when he talks about walking uprightly, he's saying the idea that we would reflect from the outside who we really are in the inside. It's a contrast between the religious and the seeker of God. The person who goes to church fulfills a promise and the one who comes and says, Lord, I want to be different. It means to be complete, right? That our inner thoughts, that our inner heart matches what we're doing on the outside or at least that that's the desire. Now, how do we cultivate that in our lives? How do we get integrity? How is it that our inside matches our outside? Well, it comes from prayer and the word. It comes from precisely what we're doing right now. As we look at him and we say, Lord, I want you to transform me. I want to be like you. I want to reflect what you've done in my life. Again, David, writing in Psalm 139, said this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, David got that, that he said, Lord, only you can examine that inner portion of me. Only you can do these things. Only you can reflect that. But my walk so often is reflected in the relationships that I have with others. See, I I can see very often a model of the way I pray or how much I pray by how much my kids pray. I can see that the way that I talk to my wife reflects very much how my kids are going to talk to others. And I can see that that inner man that's coming out sometimes doesn't match who I perceive that I want to be. But I know that God wants that to be the standard. David in verse 2 says, the one who works righteousness. Now that might sound like, whoa, 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 we don't believe in works, right? We don't believe in good works. We are not saved by works, right? Ephesians 2.9 tells us that clearly. It is a gift of God, salvation is. And yet we understand that so often God wants us to be working toward that righteousness and acting out on the righteousness that he's calling us to. That things like bless fest, where we can say, we have received so much, I want to do that for my community. 
Things like those blessing bags when we can say, God, you've blessed my life so much. You saved me. How can I extend that to someone else? The works of righteousness are just a mark of what God has done in us. And we want that to be a, 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 pr- a production of fruit in our lives. Jesus said, you didn't cho- choose me, but I chose you. And I chose you that you would bear fruit, good fruit that would last. I keep going back to that truth that God made us, designed us to reflect him. And so much of that is going to be in the way that we live out our lives. Not to gain his favor, we already have it. If our life is in Christ, we have his favor. But if we are then willing to say, I want to reflect, Lord, what you've done in my life. And that's very much connected to the next element as we work through the end of verse 2 and into verse 3. It says, he who speaks the truth in his heart He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up the reproach against his friend. Let's focus just a little bit here on the idea of words as we move into the next next element of that. He who speaks truth in his heart. See, when we look at this, we know that the truth that comes out of our mouth is very much what's in our heart. Jesus said, the overflow of your heart is what speaks, right? Right? I know very often when I'm frustrated down here, it's going to come out here. I know that. I think that's true of all of us. And our words begin right down here. And so what David is saying is, if you are speaking the truth from the heart, it's just revealing what you genuinely believe. Where do our words begin? They begin there. We know this. We had to learn a little lesson in Mexico. It was called, Si, Pero No. When someone would tell you, are you going to do this? Es sí, pero no, no voy a hacerlo así. They would tell you, yes, I'm going to do it, but no, I'm not. And so for the first couple of times, you know, I said, like, well, they said they were coming. They said they were going to do this. They said yes, but there was that sí, pero no. And I wonder how often in our lives we're telling God sí, pero no. We're telling God, you know, I'll do it, but on my terms and when I feel like it and when the time's right and blah, blah. And we're saying the exact same thing, aren't we? We're saying the exact same thing. That, that, that what's coming out of our heart isn't necessarily uh, the, the reality of what's there. Jesus made it really clear. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, right? If you say you're going to do it, just do it. And if you're not, don't. But don't soften the blow, right? So in this, in this sense, that truth from the heart is what he's looking for. Now, he goes beyond that and he says, he who does not backbite with his tongue... Or, uh, nor does he does evil to his neighbor. So really, when I think about this, and I put it in these terms, does my singing voice match my speaking voice? In other words, those words that I'm singing here, do they match the way that I'm living out there in the world? Am I able to, with the same voice, with the same words, say things uh, that glorify God? Because again, it's so easy to come in and sing these songs, and we should. But so often, we should go out and we should be singing those songs with our words and our actions to others. David is asking us, am I this person? Do I backbite with the tongue? That word backbite, it's so graphic, isn't it? Right? We've all seen little kids who've bitten one another in the back, right? Those horrible little bruises that they leave. But really, this image that God is giving us is how often can our words harm someone else when they're out of our presence and we don't recognize how valuable they are to God? Do we speak truth? Do we heal or harm? Do our words hurt others? This verse is quite strong in the way that he puts it. It goes back to integrity. Am I saying the same thing about this person when they're here as when they're not around? So, Our singing voice, like I said, should match the way that we're speaking. It should be that overflow of our words. Do I speak truth, healing or harm, grace or hurt, loyalty or distrust? See, I I believe that God really wants us, those who have the gospel, to preach the gospel in the fullest form. And that means not just the gospel itself, but all those words that build up and breed life in others. I think that because we have the gospel, because we know how to communicate who Jesus is, that should be the way that we speak in all occasions. And we all fall short. I think we all fall short in this. But here David is saying 
there, there's an examination process that's going on. Did you notice he mentions the people most likely to be harmed are those that are closest to us? And again, I can be a real nice guy to the guy that I spend five minutes to in Starbucks. Actually, I'm really nice to him, right? Because I want that coffee. But when I get close to the people around me, it's so easy to lose that sense of their preciousness and begin to speak to them as if they didn't have a value to God or a value to me. You know, James 3 puts it this way, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse man <clears throat> as it should never be. Man who is made in his image. See, this is fascinating to me that James said, look, you've got one tool to use. Use it right. Use it for what it's for. I think that that is exactly what God wants of us. He wants us to use it in a way that others would know that the same gospel that is preached with our words is going to be the way that we're talking about everything else. The tongue can't be tamed, but again, it takes us back to our heart. And again, I want to go back to that truth. The neighbor the friend is the one who's most likely to be hurt. You know, there's a statistic that says half, more than half of the people who set out to be missionaries will leave the field before their first term is over. And the reason that they do, the majority of them, is because of conflict with other missionaries. It's not the nationals. It's because the missionaries among themselves begin to hurt one another and because their relationships begin to chafe against one another because they live so closely that a lot of times they depend on one another and so they begin to hurt one another. And I think that's so true within our life as well as we begin to understand that we have so much potential to hurt others. So let's let our singing voice match our, our speaking voice. David moves on, and he talks about another area of integrity in verse 4. He says, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he who honors those who fear the Lord. Again, he's going back to this concept of integrity, going back to this idea that, again, we would honor those who love God, and that we would honor those who fear the Lord. See, what, what David is talking about, I think, is not being overwhelmed by the other voices in our lives. Not letting someone, someone or something that's perceived as powerful and, or important overtake us and allow us to forget or, or to lift up someone who doesn't, who doesn't deserve it. But rather, we would look for those people who are serving God, who love God, and say, you know what, I'm going to honor them. We, we, we have at the training center people who serve so faithfully. We have people who have given years of their life to serve there. We have a man on staff who's been there about 12 years, faithful there more every morning, every evening. What he does looks insignificant. Now, it would be easy for me to dismiss the role that he has there, but I gotta tell you, when I look at him, I'm challenged in my life, and I know that God is calling me to honor him. There's a proverb that says, do you see a man who's skilled at his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before mere men. And every time I watch this man working at the training center, I think of that proverb. I think, you know what? You're honoring God. And I want to honor you because of it. We can't allow big voices or big names to overtake our convictions. We've got to be convinced that those who honor God are worthy of esteem. And those who don't, are in need of mercy. And this is where David is saying, look, what it, what, what's your standard in your life? What is it that we're bringing in? <clears throat> As he talks about integrity, we see that worship reveals the value of goodness and selflessness. See, as we worship, we're going to recognize there is goodness that needs to be lifted up. It needs to be honored. It needs to be understood. I love when he says, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have someone who says, you know what, I'll do it, and they do it? Someone who's been there with you time in and time out? More to the point, are you that person? Are you that person who says, you know what, I I'm going to do this. I'll be there. See, I think God honors that attitude. He honors that idea of, of giving of ourselves. The, the word here is, the concept here is the idea of swapping something out. 
And it comes from the book of Leviticus when people would bring a, a less worthy offering and they would say, you know what, God, you don't really need this. So here's this three-legged blind lamb. I'm going to take this good one and I'm going to go make some lamb stew. And so the, the, the whole concept there is the one who says, I'm giving this and I'm fully giving this because God is worthy of it. It's not letting our principles be moved by convenience. It's allowing God's standard, again, to be our standard. And as, he, as we do that, worship reveals what's good, what's selfless, what's true. This idea in verse 5, when it talks about the one who keeps an oath, right? The one who does not put out his money as usury or take bribes against the innocent. Now, on the surface, this looks like the, the idea of just about money, but it's not. Usury, remember, in the, old, in the Old Testament, was the idea of loaning money with excessive interest. It was the idea of going to your neighbor and saying, okay, well, you're in need here, I'll give you this, but pay it back to me 20%. And remember, in the book of Nehemiah, we saw this, where the people had given everything to come back to Israel. And, and they're building the wall, and the work is moving forward, and then the people come to Nehemiah, and they say, you know what? We're drowning here. We don't even have enough to sustain our families because people are loaning us money while we're here, but we're paying such excessive interest, we'll never get out from under it. And Nehemiah says, you know what? You can't do that. This is your brother. This is your sister. This is a person who's co-laboring with you. You cannot do that. And again, this goes down to a heart issue. It's seeing the needs of others and saying, am I moved to compassion for their need or do I see an opportunity for gain? It's really about how we treat those who are most in need. The one who will not take a bribe against the innocent. So he uses these two contrasts. Usury, which is excessive interest, and a bribe, which is using my excess to gain access to something else. I live in a country that's corrupted with bribery. I love Mexico, but it breaks my heart that you can buy basically anything if you have enough money or have the right resources. That you can buy your way out of penalties, that you can buy a pass forward, that you can avoid the process. And you look around the world, how many countries are suffering because there's bribery? Because you can, with, with enough money, you can get out of anything. And I think this standard that God is establishing here is saying, you know what, I don't tolerate that. It's not the way I do things. This, this concept that money may reflect who we are, but really it comes down again to a hard issue. It comes down to this idea that what I have, I might use for my own gain rather than looking to it as, as an opportunity to bless others. Well, this psalm ends with a promise. He who does these things shall never be moved. So if you've done all these things perfectly, could you raise your hand tonight? If you have completely lived this out, Praise God, no one, no one does, right? Can you imagine someone in the back? Yeah, that's me. I'm the man. <clears throat> None of us does this, do we? When we begin to look at these areas, now what David's saying is not, this man will be perfectly accepted. He says he will never be moved. What does he mean by that? He means he will never trade the glory and wonder of who God is for something else. As we allow the righteous standard of God to be an unmovable standard in our lives, we're not going to be moved. And we are going to keep moving toward that goal. We're going to keep seeking God and his greatness and his holiness. And it's going to be an ongoing process in our lives. We will probably get tired. We will probably fail greatly. And we will probably at times feel like throwing in the towel. But the reality is God is moving us to this process. Did you ever think about the Apostle Paul toward the end of his life who said, I continue to press forward toward the goal, toward what Jesus Christ has called me to, toward that heavenward purpose? And this is Paul. To me, I look at it and think, man, that guy's got it locked up. He's good, right? And yet he in himself, as he drew close to God, was aware, man, I want to be more like you. I want to be more in sync with you. I want to understand better your ways. I want to reflect better the one who saved me. So as we look at this, we've got to ask ourselves, do we take these areas seriously in our life? And we have to admit, God's holiness, his ability to keep these standards is so far greater than ours. And we're challenged. 
and we should be. See, God is transforming us into his image. He is making us into his likeness. And as we come into worship, and we recognize these things, and we let them sift our hearts, and we say, you know what? I am not that person. My words aren't healing. You know, my, 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 my integrity isn't complete. We recognize the simplicity of what it is to draw close to Christ. I love what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us from all righteousness. Isn't that glorious? It's so simple. Here's David, and he's looking at the tabernacle, and he's saying, man, who can even go in there? And here's us on this side of the cross saying, you know what? I can simply confess my sins and draw close to, to Christ. Hebrews tells us that we should draw near to him with confidence, that we should enter that throne room with boldness because of what he's done. And I think that's where I want to where I want to leave this. Worship draws us to God in his transforming greatness. Because you know what? When we fall short, Jesus does not. When we fall short, Jesus completely met these righteous standards of God. He perfectly lived these out. In fact, his life was worship. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus' simple acts of obedience were worship to God. He did these things. He lived them. He offers that to us. Read with me here on the screen, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become what? The righteousness of God. That we might perfectly fulfill these things, not literally, but as an act of grace that God extends to us. Think about Jesus for a moment. In righteousness and integrity, Scripture says he was tempted in every way that we are but without sin. And in terms of words, he would only say what the Father had given him to say. So his words lined up perfectly. In questions of righteousness, he is the righteousness of God. In terms of compassion, of looking at others and seeing their value, man, there's no comparison. Just look at the cross. Look at what he did. See, Jesus fulfilled every one of these standards perfectly. And so worship has this amazing impact on us. It draws us in. It holds a mirror to us, up to us. It shows us where we fall short. And then it says, now grab hold of Jesus more tightly. Grab hold of him more tightly. And what's the product? What's the end result? It's more worship. It's more praise to him. It's more willingness to say, I know my God loves me because he did these things that I could never do. If we believe he's the source of righteousness, we can know that he can transform every area of our lives. David asks, who can abide? And the answer is no one in his own merits. No one can come. And yet the answer is everyone who has a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Every single person. I think it's important that we look back at these Old Testament examples because we understand what it was they were striving for. And we see the simplicity and the ease that we have of accessing Christ. And I don't want to take that for granted. I want to allow him to do these things. The most beautiful thing to me is that Jesus gave an invitation that was much more absolute. In John 14, 23, he said this, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him, and we will make our home in him. Do you see the contrast there? David's saying, who can access God? And God says, you know what? Give me full access to your heart. Let me fill you up to overflowing. The word there is remain, abide, build a mansion for you. He wants that place in our lives. So as we end this time together, I'll I'll just ask you this. I think we're all answering the question in the same way. Who can do this? It's Jesus. It's simply Jesus. And so tonight as you leave here, I I pray you're not beaten down and, man, that was a bummer. I pray that you're walking away saying, Jesus, take these areas of my life and transform them. Take these areas and make my worship constant. Let my words, let my integrity, let my compassion, let my way of life reflect what you've done in me. And I'll challenge you with that tonight. Choose one area. Choose one area of your life where you say, you know what, I want to come into church to worship next Sunday more fully aware that God is working in my life. Maybe it's your words. Maybe you say, you know what, I want my words to match what I'm singing here on Sunday night. 
Maybe it's your sense of compassion. You know what? I want to reflect what Jesus has done in me. Lord, show me where I can do that. Maybe it's that area of integrity where you say, you know what? I want my inside to match my outside. So I'll give you that challenge tonight, and I encourage you because Christ wants that for us. He wants that transformative process. And I assure you, it will result in more worship. Well, maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, I don't, I don't satisfy any of these requirements. These are God's righteous requirements. This is what he demands. And yet there is hope for us. And tonight, if you're here, maybe you're thinking, no, my life is, is, is nothing compared to what we're seeing here. I want to give you an opportunity. I want to give you an opportunity to surrender to Jesus Christ and allow him to begin that work in you. See, you will never meet these requirements. None of us will. None of us ever has. No man has met the perfect holy requirements of God. And so God himself came down in human form, that's Jesus, and he said, I will live that perfect life. And then he said, and you know what, I'll give that perfect life as a sacrifice on the cross. And he died. And then he said, you know what, I will trade that. I will give you my righteousness if you would simply in faith accept what I have done. So if you would join me in prayer, if you would close your eyes and and let's bow our heads and let's reflect a little bit on on what what we're considering tonight. And while your eyes are closed and your heads are bowed, I'm gonna ask you this. Would you like to surrender your life to Christ tonight? Is there anyone here who says, you know what, I would like to begin a new life in Christ. I would like to be born again. I would like to give my life to him and see him do that transforming work in me. If there's anyone here who would, who would like to take that step of faith, I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand where you're seated. Is there anyone here tonight who would like to surrender their life to Christ and let him do that work in them? Anyone, just raise your hand. This is between you and the Lord. This has nothing to do with me. Praise the Lord. I see your hand there. Praise the Lord. Amen. You can put your hand down. Good. Is there anyone else who would like to receive Christ? Anyone who says, you know what, I can't, I'm not righteous, but you are. If there's anyone else, just go ahead and raise your hand now. All right, excellent. I'm going to lead you now in a prayer. You can pray along with me. And I'm just going to ask you to invite Jesus into your heart and to give him the opportunity to lead your life. So you just pray along with me where you are. Dear Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I know that I will never fulfill the righteous standards of God. I recognize that you are holy and perfect, and I don't deserve to be in your presence. But tonight, Lord, I surrender my life to you. I offer you my life, and I ask you to receive me as your child. Lord, accept me and change me. Make me yours. I now want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. And I give myself over to you now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer tonight, this is the beginning, and you should know you are welcome. God has welcomed you, not just into this place, but into the family of God. You are his child. You've been born again. And for those of you who already know Christ, I'm gonna challenge you, go out and proclaim this message. We serve a holy, loving, righteous God who is welcoming the world to salvation. If you accepted Christ tonight, a counselor will approach you and they want to explain a little bit what it is to walk with Christ. So hang around. There's going to be a Bible for you, a little bit more explanation. And um, I'm thrilled, thrilled that God has done this work. May God bless you as you continue to walk with him. Thank you for this time. God bless you.